You are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. Today on the show, we have my good friend, really good friend, Kristen Kozelski, founder of Indigo and Co. Photography. She specializes in a luxury photography experience for folks who are looking for something different from their photography and believe in artistry, exploration, connection, and truth. I like That's that it. intro. That's Thank solid. You. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm so glad you're, that you're here. Um, guys, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna frame this up a little bit today. All right, um, it's gonna be a little bit of a different show. Um, it's gonna have kind of a different, it's definitely gonna have a whoa factor, but it might have more of that like, whoa factor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I've known Kristen for a very long time and and I knew that she was going through, through some stuff mm-hmm. and I asked her if she would be willing to come onto the show and talk about that stuff. Um, knowing that it's not the most pleasant thing to talk about, but I, I just know that um, entrepreneurship is hard. Like, yeah. super hard. <laughs> yeah. And um, like I wanna, I kinda wanna go through it, through it delicately and mm-hmm. you know, and just and present it, but I knew that it would bring a ton of value to mm-hmm. an entrepreneurial audience because I think, you know, we're in the stage right now where we're bringing, we're bringing out, you know, we've had, this is episode 34, right? Or is this 33? 30, 30, 30, 33, 34. Yeah, 34. Wow, man, that's awesome. It says 33 on it. Fail, we have team members that are failing, right? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, Episode 34, and so we've done 33 of these things already, and you know, the energy is like super positive, a lot of of great things going on, you know, businesses are growing, all this kind of stuff, but the truth is that it's not always, you know, smiles, that that there is struggle, that entrepreneurship is very, very tough and failure is something that can happen. Um, and, or, you know, not, you're not at that point, but like, but <laughs> like. been there, came but, back, yeah, yeah, there, I mean, came back, you know. <laughs> but it's tough, yeah. it, it's tough. And, it and I knew that, you know, I had the guts to at least ask Kristen if she would come on and talk <laughs> about it, and she has the guts to come on and talk about it, and I think it'll just bring a lot of value to our audience, and we can just have a really, really real hour here today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially when you're in a creative business or something like that and you're making something like from your soul. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, there are times where there's struggle and it's not like, oh, my product isn't selling. It's more like people don't like me. You know, it's this deep internal struggle that happens. So yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different from, you know, everything's awesome. (laughs) Everything is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, this episode airs on New Year's Eve, awesome. Dece- <laughs> December 31st. Awesome. So not that we want to bring everybody down right at the end of the year, but hey, instead. No. December 31st is my mom's birthday. Okay. So, so everyone should celebrate. All right, cool. So, <laughs> But we're going to, you know, heading into the new year, happy Happy New Year to everybody. 2019 is here, I'm, I'm pumped. Everybody saw yeah. the word back here on my whiteboard that says word of 2018 was like, what's the word of 2019? You asked that. The word of 2019 is definitely gonna be efficiency. New Scooters for Less has been at this at this point where we've just been, you know, growing revenue, growing revenue, growing revenue, and and as the top line grows, you know, the the expenses <laughs> have definitely grown as well. So profit margins have kind of shrunk over time, and there's a lot of things that have affected that. And and we're just in we're just in a mode of streamlining and making this place just a top, you know, just super efficient. So what's your what's going to be your word of 2019, Ty? I like efficiency. Yeah, I might have to you steal like that. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What about you? Um, well, for me, 2018 was healthy busy. Okay. Because you know, all the times people are like, "Oh, it's so great that you're busy." I'm like the next person that says that. Like, we're gonna have a talk because there's definitely too busy. Yeah. And so healthy busy was 2018. Um, so let's see. You know, I just recently heard from another podcast um, someone talking about radical self care. And you know, there's like self care, like oh yeah, I should totally make sure I go to bed at the right time. But then radical self care is like, this is what's happening, and I'm going to do this because I need it, like for myself to function at optimal 
levels. And so I might I might think about that, some radical self-care. Okay. Get any New Year's resolutions? Anything planned yet? Nothing planned yet. I like that radical self-care. Um, if my word, if I had to, to pick a word, I'd probably say vision. Got mm. so many things going on, just trying to figure out, that's what I've been kind of doing the last couple of months, like what does 2019 look like? Do you and struggle with prioritizing things like I do? Yes, absolutely. I always, yeah. Is okay. there anyone that doesn't struggle I don't know, with man. that? It's just like, mm. Priorities just shift yeah. so fast, and so much like I'll like I'll start this day and have like a, my list of to do. You know, I'm like, all right, these are the things that I'm going to accomplish today. I'm going to get these things done, <laughs> and then I'll show up to work. And it's like, hey, Colin, we need we need this, or this is happening, or this happened, or you know, whatever. And it's just like, okay, yeah. the whole day is just gone. <laughs> I get behind <laughs> constantly. Okay. Every morning, I'm behind. I right. start to feel like I'm failing a little bit. I'm not. I'm just running behind. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The to do list gets longer. Start like five things and ten things, and then they never get done, and it just keeps getting. Yeah, and then you look at your email. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna stop looking at email. Yeah, that's, right. that's and a then good. You hear, have my email yeah. forwarded to everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> genius. <laughs> and then you hear the things. I think it's like Stephen Covey or something. It's like take your to-do list, pick out three, and throw everything else away. And you're like, I would love to do that, but in reality, like some people need their photos. Like I can't just throw that list away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's hard to manage all your priorities and to-do. Yep. Well, I'm going to wish you guys a happy new year. Yeah, happy new and we're going to get yeah. into this episode. Yeah. Kristen, I know that you've seen some of the episodes mm -hmm. and you know that we always like to start with the origin stories. So before we yeah. get into the deep stuff, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into photography and, and how yeah. you got to this point today in your life? Sure. Okay. So we're going to take a trip back to the 90s, <laughs> which I know was a long time ago. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, Growing up, I always wanted to be an archaeologist slash anthropologist. And so I planned forever, that's what I was gonna do, and I was like an overachiever. So in high school, I had all these extra AP credits, so I had the opportunity to double major because most of my um, gen ed requirements were taken care of. So I was like, oh, I'll just double major in art, so I'll have anthropology, and then I'll do art just for fun. So it ended up being that I double majored in art, and that's where I started taking photography. But it was before digital photography was offered. So I ended up learning um, on film in the dark room and uh, kind of fell in love with photography at that point. Um, graduated from college in 2001, took a year off, and then went to grad school. And in grad school for anthropology, they had a dark room on campus. So I still was working in film. And so I used my film camera exclusively until about 2005. <clears throat> and then in 2008, I got my first digital SLR. And by that point, anthropology had kind of fallen away because I had a very strange graduate school experience that mm. made me not want to pursue academia. So I was kind of lost and not sure what to do with my life. And then all of a sudden, I get this digital camera in my hands in 2008, and I'm like, oh, this, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, so I started my business in 2010 part-time and uh, I got my first studio last year and now which was a shared space with three other artists and then this year I have my studio just to myself. What kind of photography do you do? Um, a lot of stuff so weddings and couples are kind of um, they're one of my favorite things to do and I work a little bit differently. I really like to be alone on a wedding day. I don't like to have an associate photographer or an assistant with me. Um, I feel very comfortable working by myself. And I kind of like to say that I'm a photo ninja. <laughs> My goal is for people to forget that I'm there um, so I can get as natural um, moments as possible. And then um, in the way that I work with people, I give them games and questions and something to talk about so that they're interacting in a natural way. And then I can hang back and photograph that. And so it's not so much like stand under this tree and put your foreheads together, because I mentioned that to somebody one time and they're like, yeah, my fiance is a foot taller than me. Our foreheads don't reach. And that's what our engagement photographer asked us to do. And I'm like, yeah, that's not who you are. So I'm not gonna ask you to do that. Instead, I'm gonna say, think of a moment you are most proud of her, you know, bring her in close and then whisper that into her ear. <laughs> and whatever you guys do is gonna be beautiful, but it's who you are. You know, and then when you see that photo, it's gonna mean that much more. Um, so weddings and couples, love it. Um, I also do a lot of work with women. And as 
folks may or may not realize women have a lot of hangups about their appearances. Um, and a lot of our self-confidence comes from how we perceive our appearances. And so working with women, um, bring them into the studio, they get professional hair and makeup, and then we do the session. And then, you know, 15 minutes into the session, like you can see the confidence come out. You know, like they, they're, I show them one photo from the back of the camera and they're like, is that me? I'm like, yeah, that's you. And they're like, how did you do that? I'm like, we just like put you in a chair, let some hair and makeup happen. And I told you to stand in a weird, awkward position and now you look like a magazine model. And they're like, this, can we do this every week? Like, sure. Um, and then they see the photos, like the finished set, and you know, something just changes in them. And to watch that happen and to see by the end of the session when they leave, like the amount of confidence that they have when they walk out, it's like, even if they never see the photos, just the experience of like giving that to them and showing them, you know, like this is you, you're amazing. Um, it's phenomenal. It's gotta make you feel good, right? Yeah. To bring out the best in people. Yeah, and make, especially. Make them feel that confidence and. Yeah, I do like a happy dance, like in the middle of the sessions, like yeah. all the time. I'm like, ah, this is it. You did this thing, it's amazing. And like your eyes and the sunlight and blah. And they, like they are all happy that I know that like it's a great shot and <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and then I also do some work with kids and families and headshots and companies. Um, so a whole bunch of stuff, but really the women and then the um, weddings and couples are my favorite. Cool. So you've been doing this a long time. I yeah. Mean, you said, you said Eight 2000. Years, man. Yeah, 2010. It'll be nine in March. So kind of, so start like kind of walk me through the the ups and downs. Like what's like mm -hmm. what's what's the biggest, you know what what has been the biggest challenge over the eight years for you? Yeah. So you know I started out part time for several years where I had a full time job or a job where I was working like 30 hours a week, um, and then eventually transitioned to full time probably. 2013 or so, I transitioned to full-time. Um, but I still had a part-time job, but I was working like 50 hours a week in my business and then working 30 hours a week in someone else's, <laughs> <laughs> or 20 hours a week in someone else's. Um, and then, you know, kind of narrowing it down from there. And, you know, I had a five-year plan when I started out and I expected by year four, like I'll be sustainable by year five, I wanna be profitable. So I knew going in that I was going to take a long time to build up the business, build it slowly and organically, which was perfect. Um, because so often you hear about creatives who have burnout because they just get overwhelmed. <clears throat> Excuse me. They just get overwhelmed and um, then they just stop and they never continue. And I really didn't want that to be me. So I was very careful to build it slowly. Um, and so then after year five, I never made another five year plan, you know? So I just kind of so hung were those, out. were those five years? They worked like they were supposed to. Plan? to. Yeah, okay. and then I like got to year five and forgot that I had made a five year plan and I should make another one now that like I have, you know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but so then I kind of hung out at that same level for a while. And then all of a sudden, um, maybe 2016, I think, um, I ended up having an insane fall. So for us, we have a peak season in spring and a peak season in fall, winter. Um, and so fall, winter is usually the biggest one because that's, um, there's weddings and definitely the bye week for football season. So if you're planning a wedding, look at the football schedule. Don't yeah. do a home game. We just went through that mistake. Right. Brad and Hannah. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> My brother yeah, married Hannah here at the dealership they met here. Mm -hmm. and it, it was it was really awesome. We had like the whole sales, you know, we had, we had the whole team. We had the repaint team as well as, um, you know, the new scooters for less team all there. And, and it, it was it was really, really cool. Um, mainly the new scooters for less team is the, really the repaint video team that was there. But um, man, it was like, I gave them a hard time because it was on Florida, Georgia mm -hmm. a week. And even though it's not a home game, it's still like, man, yeah. man, I was like Florida, Georgia guys. Like, yeah. and the wedding was at 4.30. And, uh, so yeah. I tried, I, actually I tried not to make a big deal because I wanted their wedding to be great. <laughs> and it was, the wedding was fantastic. And, but yeah. Yeah, I actually talked to them about the wedding. I talked to um, Hannah and her mom, Holly, but yeah. I had already been booked uh -oh. because, so what I was gonna say is that like your wedding vendors for bye week or for you know away games are going to be booked out a year Quick. in advance. Yeah. Okay. So aim for spring, not hurricane season, 
and uh, yeah, book in advance. Anyway, lost track of where I was. <laughs> Sorry. 2016. <laughs> That's busy, what happens. Busy I fall. go off on my little spiels. That like <laughs> makes me think of something. I'm like, oh, yeah, I just went through that. Yeah. So it was an insanely busy fall. I had the most weddings I'd ever had in one season. Um, so that was seven weddings in like two and a half months, three month period. So that's almost every weekend that I'm working a 12 hour day on a Saturday. And then um, I started Socially Loved with Charlie Delatore from Tower Publications. And so the first two issues we knew were gonna be a lot of work because they were the first two issues. Um, and so that, I think I did almost 80 shoots for them between um, July and December. And then on top of that, holiday stuff. So then there was all of my other regular work that I get throughout the year. And so that season really kind of pushed me over the edge. Hmm. So I didn't get caught up on editing for, I don't know, six or eight months. Okay, so simply simply because of workload? Or simply because, lot? I mean, I could shoot five shoots in a day if I need to. You know, I'm gonna be tired by the last one, but I can do it. But then if I do one shoot and editing takes you know, four times as long as the shoot does, that backlog builds up quick, you know? And so I, and the magazine needed stuff for deadline. So that had to get prioritized, whether that's what I wanted or not for the rest of my clients. So then all my other clients are like, hey, where's my stuff? Hey, where's, where's my stuff? Where's my stuff? And I'm like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. So I was working I actually like did a timesheet for myself on an average week and it was easily 70 hours. I would do 40 hours by Wednesday, from Sunday to Wednesday, I was already at 40 hours. Um, and that just took it out of me, you know? And that so that, plus people and when was asking. was that, like what year? Like so fall 2016 into 2017, probably yeah. into spring of 2017. And so at that point, people from weddings are like, hey, you said it was gonna be you know, eight weeks and now we're on like four months, like what are we supposed to expect? And you know, I don't feel like this is right. And I'm like, I am, I physically cannot work any harder. I cannot work any more hours. Um, and so I was like letting people down left and right and working like a crazy person, not taking care of myself. And it really caught up to me um, and I never, thought that I would ever be burnt out, but then it turned out that it happened. And it was so, it was so hard because on one level, I'm getting all this work and I'm getting all these compliments from people who are like, oh my God, your work is amazing. Um, you know, I love what you do. I loved working with you for the wedding. Like I'll leave the wedding and people, it's almost like the uh, portrait sessions. They don't even see the photos yet. And they're like, you did such a good job, we we're so happy you're here. And like, I'll get a testimonial, they haven't even seen the pictures. Like they're assuming I'm taking pictures the whole time and they don't even know, right? And I still get this wonderful testimonial. So I would get all these like things on the outside saying like, you know, how wonderful I am and it looks like I'm doing so good. And then on the inside, I'm like dying, <laughs> you know? And so I think around August of 2017, I was like, I kind of hit a wall. And uh, I also figured out how much money I'd actually earned that year and it was very, very sad because I hadn't been taking new work because I was so busy trying to get caught up mm. on everything from the fall. So I wasn't making any money. I think honestly I took home by August, my personal amount that I took home was like $16,000. And like, that's not enough to live on, <laughs> you know? And I live very modestly, but it's still, I mean, that's hard. Right, and so, yeah, it just kind of came to a head, and then I think it was November, I was like, I'm done, I'm closing the business, forget it, I'm quitting, I'm gonna put my camera away, I'm getting a job, this is awful, I never wanna do it again. Simply from burnout. Simply from burnout. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was Did you, any time through that process, you never thought to like, like seek help from somebody who could like, like an maybe, assistant? I don't know, and mm -hmm. like edit photos yep, or? Yeah, I did. I had did? an editing assistant. Okay. And she was, um, she was with me. When did you make the call to bring her on? Pretty early after I got into the studio. So I got into that studio, that was the one where I shared with a few other artists. I got in there in, I think January, and I think I brought Angela on um, 
within the first month or two that I was there. Because I knew that I needed help. Okay, and did it help get you caught up? It did help me get caught up, but I was also so far behind. So if I have seven weddings, and uh, let's say that that's at least you know, 50 hours of editing per wedding, just do the math right there. And that's not counting everything else I'm doing. That's not even like answering emails and you know, like all the basics. The, the like it just takes it. huge amounts of time. And so there were a lot of people who said, Well, you know, why don't you just, you know, edit faster? No one's gonna know if the photos are not, you know, the way that you want them to be. No one's gonna know if they're not perfect, you know. And I'm like, I can't do that. That's my gut does not work that way. I only deliver the best I can, and that takes a lot of time. You know, it's just, I'm slow. I know this about myself, and if I try to go faster, I'm not gonna be happy with the quality. I don't want my name on it, and that's not what people deserve when they're paying me, like, a decent amount of money to shoot a wedding. You know, it's like, they deserve the best I can do, and that's what I'm gonna do. So, it was overwhelming. Yeah, so what happened when you hit that wall? I mean, did you so, s- stop working? Did you? I did. You did? I finished out the commitments I had, and then I didn't, I basically didn't do anything new for all of Q4 for 2017. And, but at that point I did start seeing a therapist, and I did start um, uh, like a generic version of Zoloft, like a very, very small dose. And so did, so you hit a stage of depression? Yeah, it was very bad. It was, so depression is something that's come in and out of my life since I was in high school. And uh, I kind of liken it to a fog that rolls in. So it's like this fog comes in and you can't see everything clearly. Things just feel differently. Life is like so hard, (laughs) you know, like basic stuff is really, really, like taking out the recycling is an impossible task. You know, it shouldn't be that hard to like walk it from your house to the, to the road, but it's just like, that is too hard, I can't do it right now. And so it was like going through that kind of experience and then trying to answer people's emails of, hey, where's my stuff? And it's like, I've told you four or five times, like I'm working as hard as I can, I don't know what else to tell you. So then I would start to hide. Um, And you know, all it just like built on itself over and over and over again. And so um, at that point I was like, okay, (laughs) <laughs> I feel like I need some help here. Like, I'm clearly not able to get through this on my own. Um, and it's like in those moments of clarity, like they come briefly where you're like, okay, I recognize that there's a problem here and I recognize that I need to do something about it and I have to act on that immediately because that mom- the moment that depression like rolls back in, making that phone call is too hard. Is it true that, and I, I don't know if I've ever been in a true state of depression. Like I've sad moments in my life, Mm -hmm. but like I've never had to have medication for anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think there's a lot of people like me who like don't really understand it, that want to understand it. Um, So maybe you can kind of like walk me through that a little bit or like somebody, somebody like me, you know, what, well, actually before that, like I'm very interested in how you knew you needed help because I feel like a lot of people if I had to assume, reach a stage of denial, mm-hmm. and they, they're like, oh no, like I'm, like I'm fine, like I'll get over it, like I'm just in a down moment, or you know, like how did, how did you know that you needed help, and, right. and were you even in a stage of denial? Mm-hmm. Well, at least in my experience, it's not so much denial, um, and with other people I've spoken to who have depression, um, one of the things is that you don't want to talk to anyone. You kind of want to close off. So the last thing you want to do is talk to people. Everyone's like, oh, just give me a call if you need something, if you ever want to talk. And you're like, okay, I am never calling you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because you really just want to close down and hide. Um, and especially for me, um, avoidance is kind of where I go. It's much easier for me to hide than to pretend that everything's okay and be like dying inside. There are a lot of people who can do that. For me, I'm just like, nope, I'm just not gonna talk to anyone. I'm not gonna answer the phone. I'm not gonna answer emails. I'm not gonna leave the house. Um, But for me, the way it feels is that um, I feel it in, like in my chest, in my body. 
um, that just doing basic things like making a decision, um, answering a phone, it feels like this stress and tension that comes in and it's like getting past that stress and tension to be able to do that one small thing feels like a mountain. Like it's this enormous task to overcome that feeling that you have in order to just do the one small thing. Um, Like doing dishes, cleaning your house, you know, like a lot of people I've talked to, they'll notice that um, the state of your kitchen counter very much reflects the state of your brain. Mm. So like when my kitchen counter starts to get cluttered and whether that's just like mail and you know, like my little fedora sun hat thing is sitting there and then like the keys are sitting there and then like the new bag of cat food that I haven't put in the cabinet yet, like stuff just piles up and it's not dirty, but it's just like stuff that's there. It's like, oh, that's what's happening in my brain too. It's really strange. Um, But then you know, sometimes you have these moments where you're like, oh, I feel like cleaning the counter. Or, oh, I feel like I can see what's happening. And um, that's the moment when I know it's time to do something about it. Um, but yeah, even when that when that fog is there and when the, um, it's kind of like sadness, but it's more like hopelessness. It's more like, forget everything, like, I suck at life, I'm terrible at everything, like why should I even try, just forget it. And uh, there's sometimes just like a brief moment where there's a window that opens and you're like, okay, I need to act on this right now because if I don't, I'm not going to do it later. Now you said like this kind of goes back to childhood even? High school. Okay, Mm -hmm. I mean, is it because of things that happened in high school? Like where, did you have a low self-esteem? Did you like? I'm trying. I'm trying to put a puzzle mm-hmm. together that I yeah. don't know how to put together. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's how well, I feel right. How is, I feel right now, and I don't know if it's just because I'm like in business. Like I'm, su- I'm. A, sometimes I feel like I'm overconfident. Well, and like, that's you know the what thing. I mean, and, and yeah. I think that kind of helps me. I'm like I'm like I'm gonna crush the world no matter what, even if I have a bad day today. Like I know long term that I'm gonna make it. I just have mm-hmm. that. I just have that confidence. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know what it's like not to have that confidence. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a couple of things there. So one is, um, yeah, I think there is some level of unbridled optimism that has to come with entrepreneurship, right? And so that's an interesting piece for me because on some levels, I have moments where I'm just like, forget it, I should give up, I should close the business, I'm failing, It's it's horrible. And then there's other times where I'm like, but I know what I'm doing is so helpful and so meaningful and I love it so much. And there are other people in the world that make this happen. Like I have to be able to do this and like, I'm not ready to give up. I'm not ready to quit. You know, there's that definite feeling of like, maybe it sucks now, but <clears throat> three years from now, <clears throat> excuse me, three years from now, like I'm gonna get there, it's gonna be amazing. You know, it's like that level of optimism I think is required for entrepreneurship. And you have that? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, Um, but in terms of where it comes from, so part of it is um, inherited. You know, there's, I have a history of it in my family. Um, There's, on both sides actually, there's a history of it. And so part of it is that no matter how healthy I am and how much I take care of myself, it's always a thing that um, is a risk for me. And um, I'm not the only one in my family that has it like in in my current generation. Um, But I do think that there is a lot of self-confidence issues that that does, at least for me, accompany it. Um, And I think that's also true of a lot of women. Um, What's interesting is that, so when I went to the therapist last year and she suggested, um, you know, a very low dose of Zoloft and then I went to um, my doctor and was talking with her about it. And she's like, can I tell you how many women business owners come in here with the same thing? Hmm. So many women are trying to hold themselves to the standard that's impossible and feeling like they're failing and they can't get there and they can't get there and they're hiding from the world that they're not what everyone thinks they should be. Um, Do you think some of that is painted? 
like because of social media, because of Instagram, yeah. because of all these things, we paint this perfect picture. Yeah. And like, and even I, I mean, Ty said something. You know, I post, I posted up, uh, you know, something yesterday that was that was excellent. It was feedback from from one of our clients. It was like, Colin, your social media, like the, your your strategy is working. It's crushing it. Like this is awesome. I just landed this huge deal because you know, like, and mm-hmm. that feels good. And like those moments, like I'm gonna share those moments with the world. But like, yeah, the bad moments. Nobody yeah. wants to share with the world. Well, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right, know? right, exactly. You know, but I mean, you see it probably all the time with social media. There's this yeah. picture that's painted of everything so grand and so great. Mm-hmm. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, I paint it every single day. Yeah. You know, and I don't. I've definitely been through some of the same stuff. But uh, mm-hmm. um, you've yeah, gone through so a state sh- of depression, or? Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, you know, in a different scope. Um, not to jump ahead, I'm yeah, sorry. very yeah. thankful for you being so open. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, just being like a golfer, you know, mm-hmm. playing professional golf, like you constantly fail, always. Um, you know, you play a tournament with 180 guys, there's only one winner, there's 179 losers. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's entrepreneurship like at its finest. <laughs> um, yeah, and it is. You know, when you turn professional in golf, um, unless you're one of the top players in the in the world coming out of college, you're pretty much playing on your own dime or someone else's dime. You're not signed to a team, you know, there's nothing. Um, so money goes pretty quick and you can have really good long weeks working 80 hours, you know, working your ass off, playing well, you miss some putts, you make $2,500 for the week, costs you three grand for the week mm-hmm. and you lost. You do that three or four weeks in a row and you're like, am I doing the right things? Mm. Um, and I went through that a little bit and got hurt and it's like, all this time, effort, and I've got nothing to show for it, and I feel like I'm advancing, and I'm working hard, and I'm being positive, and I'm still not getting enough out of it. Um, and I've been like, you know, up and down with this since I got done with school, and um, I'm still trying to play a little bit. You know, it doesn't go away, mm-hmm. and sometimes that depresses you in a way where you still have the fire to do it, and I still do, but I do other stuff now too, and it's. Some of the other stuff I do is so I can still dream and still want to play, um, and I'm still trying to play. So it's like, yeah, you know, you're your That's own it. worst yeah. enemy. But uh, you know, you gotta you learn a lot about yourself if you're willing <laughs> to fight. Um, it's it's tough. I mean, my roommate at Florida is Billy Horschel. He's made over twenty million dollars um, in his career. So sometimes I'll introduce myself as. Yeah, I'm like the the bad roommate. You know, <laughs> you know he made thirteen million dollars in three weeks. He won three consecutive times in two thousand six or two thousand fifteen, and you know, it's not that far off. You know, I've got other teammates that are awesome that have you know failed or lost their cards, and it's golf is a entrepreneurship at its core. Mm-hmm. You know, you're constantly working and no one's paying you um, until you're paid a astronomical amount of money. Um, hopefully, at some point. But yeah, I've definitely. You know, and that kind of guides me in some of the other stuff I do, um, where I'm I'm almost patient to a fault, or I don't really get too high or low. I'm kind of like even keel, and I think it's kind of that golf mentality where it's like even if it looks good, like I'm constantly trying to make sure I'm doing the right thing and looking at it the right way, and not being unconfident, but not being overconfident. Where I'm like the end all, you know, social media person. I'm like I'm not that good. I just I'm thoughtful about it and I try to keep getting better and learning from, I work with photographers all the time and Mm -hmm. I'm always freaked out to ask other creatives what they charge, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit, you know, how do you price Mm -hmm. yourselves? How do you, because time is everything and you know, some photographers, I'm sure you've worked with them or you know them that, you know, they don't edit the same way you do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a cash business and they're they're just going through the motions and they're lead gen and they're, you know, making yeah, a ton like of a money, but they're, yeah, it's a volume model. Yeah. yeah, and that's who you're competing with. And then, mm-hmm. like we were talking earlier, you know, Instagram is so good in a way, but also so evil. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you can be exceptional on an iPhone, you know, or curate other people's stuff and you look like you know what you're doing and you really don't. <laughs> um, yeah. And everyone's got a business, you know, everyone's mm-hmm. an influencer, yeah. everything's this. and. It's hard. We always talk about like kind of cutting through the fluff of leadership and coaching and photography. I mean, it's all, it's all there, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a lot to think about. Yeah, and it's easy to get so, off track. So I mean, when it brings you down or when things aren't going right, and you, I mean, if you've been in a state of like, how do I know I'm in a state of depression? 
I like, like what I mean, she said I, I about, have, the, uh, about the fog. You stop being able to like see see the vision. Some days it's like I've got all these different timelines and they're all awesome and it's like choose your own adventure. They're all going to be great adventures. And then sometimes it's like I'm just there's wall, wall, wall. Like I don't want to do it. Okay. Like, I, I mean, because there's plenty of days where I like have locked myself into the bathroom and cried. <laughs> yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But it's like, yeah. is that. Well, so it's like, is that, you know happening for a couple of days or is it happening for like two months straight? Yeah. Okay. If you're getting to like multiple weeks of like, I just can't get past this, that's probably a warning sign. Okay. Yeah. I think actually one of the official definitions is something like a deep sadness that lasts for more than two weeks without something like a death in the family. You know, if it's just mm. like happening, but there's yeah. no like immediate cause that will change over time okay yeah. so when you so you started taking that minor dose of zoloft mm-hmm. i mean oh my god what was the recovery process <laughs> yeah. so i had taken a very small amount when i was in college for a couple of years and then um so it's some of it kind of was still in my system and so they said that when i started taking it again i'll probably get a, um, a reaction quicker otherwise it takes a little while for it to build up in your system before you get it And uh, oh my goodness, I was like, wait, is this what people feel like all the time? This is amazing, I haven't felt this way in years. And it's like, you actually feel like, okay. (laughs) And like excited to do things. And like answering the phone isn't terrifying. And it's just, it's amazing what a difference it was. And even though it's like a starter, I'm still on a starter dose a year later, you know? And it's just, just a tiny, tiny amount, but the, the difference it makes in like being able to function as a regular human is huge, huge. huge. Okay, and so like, are you still on it or? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And yep. I mean, so what's the recovery process so like? So they were telling me that um, if you stay on it for a year or two, the chances of um, severe depression returning goes down. So, you know, after you've been on it for a certain amount of time, it's kind of in your system and it'll hang out there, I guess, for a while. Um, I don't actually know, not a doctor, not a doctor. Um, but they said that it will significantly decrease the chances that it'll that your depression will return. Um, so I'm like, let's do that right, because so, so, I don't want this back. So now you're on medication, you got medication, you got help. Mm-hmm. So you saw a therapist or you still are? Uh, I saw one for a while and then I stopped and now I am again. Okay, so like when were you like, I'm gonna get back on the horse, I'm gonna get going again? January of last year. December of last year, I was like, okay, actually maybe I can do this. Um, so it took a few months, but I was like, you know what, I'm I'm not ready to give up. I thought that I was, but I'm not. And I am I really wanna, wanna do this. And so that's when I rebranded. Um, I started over so that I could reinvent the business model a little bit. So. Um, some of the reasons that I had um, like maybe accepted too much work or you know, some things just weren't working in the business. And after eight years, I felt like it was time to rebrand, time to elevate the business a little bit. So instead of being like Julie Marie Photography, instead of just my name, it was something a little bit more high end. Um, the branding and logo and website and everything would be a little bit more high end so people would know like from the get go that like this is not gonna be a $50 photographer. Um, And I got excited about the rebrand. I got excited thinking about the pricing again. I got excited thinking about, like I love the strategy behind, you know, a business. I think that's really exciting. And I never thought I would enjoy it as much as I do. Um, So I got really excited about all those things again. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm ready to do this. And so at that point, um, you know, I launched the new website, got the new studio, and kind of started everything over. So yeah, that was like January. Okay, so, so where are you at now? Um, so honestly, now I'm kind of in the fog again. <laughs> um, it's happening right now, and I figured out what some of the triggers are. So I think that's really important for people, especially business owners, is to understand what your triggers are and then in the times when you're feeling good, have a plan for what you're gonna do when you're in the fog. So for me, some of the triggers are um, if I am not 
delivering what people want. So I'm very much a people pleaser, and I'm one of these people that will sacrifice myself in order to make other people happy. Is that your right. love language? Acts of service? No. It's not? No, actually. Um, at what? least not for, well, it's, it is for giving, it's not for receiving. Okay. Um, so yeah, I will give way more than um, I should. And so then if there's anything that somebody isn't happy with, I immediately am like, I feel terrible, right? And so even if it's like, I'm just slow on delivering the photos because of whatever else is going on, um, I start to feel really bad. So I get two people who are like, hey, you know, we've been waiting and we just wanna know where our photos are. I'm like, like that's a trigger for me. Mm. Another one is if um, there is financial problems if I'm not able to meet all of my financial goals and like I'm starting to have trouble paying stuff, which in business happens, feast or famine, especially in seasonal industries. So by the end of the summer, like I had no work in August because it's August, it's a million degrees out, so no one's getting married, there are no outdoor photo shoots. Everyone's on vacation before the school starts and school is starting, so all the corporate work is out. Um, basically, you know, that's just the slowest month of the year. And this year, it was particularly bad for me. And so then there was like, just this little like constant, like, oh my God, I just gotta make sure I get the $100 in this week so that, you know, I can make sure that this matches up with this, you know? And so between financial struggle <clears throat> and then a couple of times where people just want things, like that piles together. And I know that that's where my, um, that's where my weakness is. And that's a trigger for me, so. And I don't want to say trigger. I feel like that's such a, you know, a yeah. buzzword right now. But something that I know um, will kind of push me towards the depression. So, yeah. I mean, even like through this conversation, I feel like when I'm listening to you, it's a very mild depression. Maybe am you I, know. Am I, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, right now it is, but. The times in the like last in the past, August that was not was not. Have that you had anything true. that's like as maybe the triggers you start to realize they're happening? Have you found anything that's helpful to take your mind off of it? Anything you've like yeah. added to your routine? Or I know mm -hmm. for me, some of the things like you know just drinking more water and maybe I. I can be, eat very healthy, so I just like juicing and running and eating more water, like I can kind of kickstart myself. So it's like, mm -hmm. as soon as I start to feel a little bit like bad, it's like I'm, I have to go do it. I just have to cleanse, maybe I'll fast for 48 hours, just like shock myself. Mm -hmm. um, or, and I've kind of been bad at this, but in my history I've had a good kind of uh, Outlook is like at trying to add something like just bizarre, like just trying to go do something, even if mm -hmm. it's like a, you know, new haircut or like just something crazy. Um, and, you know, I'm constantly kind of like looking and scouring, like what can I maybe add? What can I mm -hmm. try? Like, not always to maybe sometimes to advance my skill set or, you know, have you worked on anything like that or tried anything that's worked? Yeah. So for me, um I, I, especially when I'm in a very bad place, I just know like intuitively, like I have to go do as much yoga as I possibly can. Mm. So one thing that's good about it is I'm in a room where somebody else is telling me what to do, right? So I don't have to be making decisions. I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to think about everything that's not going right. Um, I can just be in that room. Somebody's telling me what to do, great. Also the physical activity, getting exercise is a huge, part to maintaining mental health. Um, and so I like to go to the 7 a.m. class, go first thing in the morning. It helps me kind of get right for the day. Um, so I still do that a lot. Um, I'm going probably three, four times a week right now. Um, but I think, especially in times of depression, like every single class I can make, I, I go to. Um, and then also, it's, you know, it's quiet, it's comfortable, it's a good space to kind of let your brain chill out. Um, so. That I think has been very helpful for me. Um, also, I do uh, capoeira. So I train at the um, Capoeira Academy of Gainesville under Apex Martial Arts. And it's like a family there. So even though I don't feel like talking to anyone, I don't feel like doing anything and stuff is just hard, 
um, I go there and uh, eat. no one has to know what I'm going through, but it's just like, again, like physical exertion. Someone's telling me what to do and I have people there. Yeah, I don't have to I talk mean, about building what's like happening. a support network. Yeah. Yeah. They don't need to know what's happening. They don't care. You know, I mean, not that they don't care, but like, right. they're not going to be like, oh, what's happening with you today? It's like we're all there to just do the thing. And it's great. Um, and it's an awesome martial art because it is it's an Afro-Brazilian martial art. So one of the things I love is that I'm the only white girl in the room, you know, and like that doesn't happen for me often, you know, like. It's nice to be in a place where I'm the minority. And then um, it's music with the physical movement. So there's instruments, there's singing, and there's the movement. And so in the movements, you know, it's not like sparring like you're actually trying to hurt someone. It's more like having a conversation with someone when you're playing. And so it's also just something really different, kind of out of the box that a lot of people aren't familiar with that is also very helpful for when things are really hard. It's just something totally different. It's so. cool that you found a way to like to cope and have the support system and mm -hmm. that's I mean yeah. I think that's really cool. And getting enough sleep makes a huge yeah. difference too. And then kind of on the financial side, saying like August is mm -hmm. a typically, you know, down month. Have you looked into adding anything kind of different? I know on your website you've offered some classes before yep. or whatever. Um, yeah, so know. anytime I offer a headshot special, that's yeah. what's happening, yeah. <laughs> right? It's yeah. like, well, it's how like can I get $800 money. in the door like this, you yeah. know? Okay. Um, so headshot specials, uh, classes, absolutely. Um, and do you mentor any other, you know, like younger photographers? Yeah. I know like when August comes for, just on the best of Gainesville tonight, not other stuff I do, but it's like a total content boom. Like, I don't have to try as hard to curate things. People are tagging all sorts of things. People are following and they're excited because there's just more people in town. Um, and I think obviously Colin sells a lot more scooters. <laughs> so it's like kind of trying to take advantage of when Gainesville's booming, how do you do it? Um, yeah. And I know there's a ton of photography, you know, it just seems if there's a way to figure out how to like monetize the boom that is August. It could be kind of a, a really nice way to look, you know, into 2019. How, yeah. how do you take advantage of typically your bad times, but Gainesville's mm -hmm. good times? Because there's something there. If, yeah, if and there has to be out. something, like while a lot of the folks that are coming into town are students um, and their budget might not necessarily line up with my services yeah. per se, but there has to be some way to kind of find, you know, whether that's mini sessions or something. Yeah, to, I've even done like middleman stuff where I've worked with um, like events to do like event photography mm -hmm. and I don't take the photography and I'll just like farm it out to a few people. You know, I tell them, hey, you know, check out their Instagram, like check out these six people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll do maybe a post or some promotion for the event. You know, tell me what the budget is and it's probably a horrible way to do it with photographers. I'm like, hey, they've got 300 bucks, like these eight people, they only want like eight decent photos. You can go mm -hmm. to the event for free, you know, it's a hundred dollar ticket, you know. Yeah. You know, and it's hard, because I feel bad sometimes, because I'm devaluing some people, but some people look at it as an opportunity, mm -hmm. and depending where they are in their business, if it's a business or a side business, or just something they like to do, um, it fits for somebody. Yeah. Um, and I've used multiple people and multiple Instagram accounts, and it just, I'm still trying to figure that out on my side. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there doesn't seem to be like there's a great medium for it really where local businesses can act with local influencers that act with photographers where it all mashes up. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what I'm trying to figure out through Best Begins. Like, how do I put all these pieces together yeah. and make everybody happy and then make the brand look good? Right. Um, I feel like I just had an idea. There should be like an influencer boot camp that happens in August. Yeah, and I ran right? for the for the best of Gainesville magazine. I ran this huge Instagram meetup or influencer meetup, and Taylor was there, and we had like probably 75, 80 people come out, and it's the community is there. And I think mm -hmm. we're, I was going to ask you about building, you know, the photography community in town. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yeah. Um, but you know what's so interesting is that. 
me and Adrian Fletcher, another photographer in town, we chair the um, Gainesville for Pro- Professional Photographers group, and we try to have a meeting every month. It turns out that we normally have them like at least once a quarter, but there's only like three or four of us that go to every meeting. There's yeah. like a ton of photographers that don't come. And I've also had meetings for um, people thinking about starting a photography business, but they're not sure like where to start and how to get going. Um, And the last one I had, no one came. And I'm like, I am trying to help and build a community. Like when I first came here and started, it was very catty, you know? And I'm Mm. like, this is not gonna help anyone. And especially how do we handle the slow seasons? How do we handle when we're selling something that we made with our heart? You know, that's very different from like selling a widget, you know, like a, like a fidget spinner. (laughs) It's very different, you know, and uh, I want to have that network of people. Yeah. And one of the things I've played around with and I haven't had the time to do it is uh, almost like a bar crawl, but like a content crawl where Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, a hundred of us just hit these. 25 businesses or 40 businesses in 20 locations over a weekend, kind of like a startup weekend. You know, Mm -hmm. Friday through Sunday, we're visiting all these places, amazing photographers with different perspectives and videographers and in whatever, whoever Mm -hmm. they think they are, you know, come out and see who you vibe with. You know, restaurants will set up stuff with cool looking food and hopefully the weather's good and Mm -hmm. just like, See what Gainesville can do. Yeah, and you know, set just it up, bro. What are you waiting for? I know. Come on, Ty. It's a lot of stuff. Man. <laughs> do it, man. I've got a lot up here. I, I know. Just, Great ideas. I it's know. all about the execution now, Ty. I know. Well, I'm reading this book it. that that my friend Colin got me. So <laughs> I'm only through chapter one. So <laughs> okay. maybe once I finish Get with it, it, man. Gary Come on, just execute. It. It's all about the execution. But, uh, well, I, I kind of want. I'll, we only have a few more minutes, okay. and so I'd like to kind of circle back to a couple couple little things um you know how can someone like me who doesn't really know depression mm-hmm. look out for it in friends like yourself or team members even I'm, you know i'm even thinking like if one of my team members yeah. is going through something like this how can i recognize it how and then how should i as an employer help with it yeah so i think for me, but I think pretty commonly, is um, people kind of shut down a little bit. So, you know, when I'm feeling good, I'm super excited about connecting with people and like, you know, organizing stuff and I get all excited about events and blah, blah, blah. But then when I'm not in a good space, I'm just like hiding, right? And so my sister has learned, she's like, I haven't heard from you in a while. Are you okay? What's Mm. going on? Like she knows that if I'm not responding to the family emails and the family texts, she's, she reaches out. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Don't wanna talk about it. I <laughs> just like go right off the map. Um, but I think that's the thing that happens is that people who are normally very outgoing will just kind of- Shut down. Shut down a little bit. And like, you know, stuff will get done. The basics will get done. But um, yeah, just the enthusiasm and, um, level of connection won't be there. I'm not an introvert, so I can't speak for in people who are normally introverted and then going through depression, but um, yeah, that that would be, but the thing is is that a lot of times people don't wanna talk about it. They don't wanna share it. Um, Isn't that tough though, like for, I, I mean, would we're, say we're, we're, you do a, you probably do a tremendous job with it because you've set up you have an empathetic leadership style where you people do. can be you themselves do. at work. I mean, you can just see this place, how it, mm-hmm. how you guys interact together. So people, when they, I think when they like coming to work and they can feel like they can be themselves. And they trust that's, you. And they trust you, that's almost enough for mm-hmm. some people to, you know, they don't need to maybe tell you everything because at least they feel comfortable here and maybe it's how they get away a little bit. Yeah, because it's a positive work environment. Yeah, I mean, I've known you for years. I know you care for your people. And so, like, if you were somebody working for a place where you knew that your boss, like, didn't care about you at all, like, that would be a very different situation. (laughs) I just don't, I just don't want to be caught off guard. And what I mean by that is, like, I feel like, you know, 2018, one, suicide Mm -hmm. in entrepreneurship is at its highest, like, ever. Yeah. Right, like ever. 
So and then and then I mean just in general you you see people like Robin Williams who's like has yeah. this perfect you know pic, picture ordained. perfect life yeah yeah exactly like picture perfect life you know happy go lucky like everything but like people didn't recognize it and you say like well you know people shut down they they tend to stay to themselves mm -hmm. they're not you know like they're not out talking about it when if they're not then then how can we help them I know I know and so this is. Part of what I am doing is trying to talk about it so that other people can talk about it too. Because yeah. every so, single time I say something, so many people are like, oh my God, me too. And I, like I, on Instagram and Facebook, I'm open about it and I will share like, I don't know if I can say this, but shit's tough today. You know, yeah. this is just hard and like, it's not a great day and I'm trying, you know? And then so many people will privately contact me and be like, I'm so glad you said that because I have the same thing. But nobody's talking about it. So I'm like, okay, the more we can talk about it, then it's not as stigmatized. And then, you know, if somebody comes to you and it's like, look, man, like this is happening right now and I just don't know what to do. Um, you know, bear with me as I'm going through this, then then it won't be so hard for people to bring it up. You know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so for somebody who is listening to this mm -hmm. and who is in that state, Maybe their business is about to fail, just going through tough times. Maybe maybe it has nothing to do with work at all, and has it's all personal. You know, like mm -hmm. who knows? Somebody's yeah. somebody's in a very has reached that state of depression, like, but they haven't necessarily taken any steps, taken any steps to get help yeah. or build. You know, get, go to a therapist like you have, mm -hmm. like create a support group. Like, yeah, you know, like I mean, what should be step one? Um, step one, I feel when you have that moment of clarity is to call for a therapist, um, even if you feel like you can't afford it. And the thing is, like, even though technically it's kind of covered by insurance, there's no, there's not a lot of opportunities for good mental health care that is covered by insurance. Um, that's like a whole other topic, but there's not a whole lot of that available. So even if it's something that you think you can't afford monetarily, you also can't afford not to. You need to find a way to do it. There is in Gainesville um, some free counseling services that are available through, I think it's the county or the city. Um, but there are some free services um, where you can go and you can get free appointments and um, meet with a counselor for a few weeks. Um, that is at least a good start. I've done that before when I didn't have the money to pay for a therapist. Um, talk to your doctor too. Um, I know that like the folks that celebrate primary care, like their goal is to partner with other medical professionals in town so that their membership can get discounted rates. Um, and I think, I don't know if they have one or they're in the process of looking for mental health person. Um, so, you know, there's lots of avenues out there, um, but I definitely suggest getting a counselor, getting help in some way. Um, if that's totally not possible and not what you're interested in, uh, writing about it, talking to a friend about it, making music, whatever you do, like as a kind of creative output can help. Um, but I think that the longer you sit with it alone in your own brain, um, the worse it is. Because like your brain <laughs> is not always your friend in this situation, you know? It can also make it seem a lot worse than it actually is. So, um, Okay, well, I'll be the first. I mean, like, obviously, this entire podcast, I've pretty much clearly stated that I don't know anything about it. <laughs> this is also been... just give people hugs, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is very educational for me. I miss mean, the best thing about the podcast for me is that I learn something new every day. Yeah. Um, but like, one the one thing I do know from a business side, you know, early early on, and I don't know if I've shared this story before, but like the the Chamber of Commerce, when I really started getting involved with the Chamber of Commerce, one of the things that they that they had created was entrepreneurial roundtables, yeah, right? Yeah, I was, was in like, one. Okay, it was like mm -hmm. a CEO um, CEO roundtable, and and now I've I've been in an effort to really kind of duplicate these types of things mm -hmm. all, all over. Yeah, um, because it was super I, helpful. I, I, yeah, I just found a lot of value in it, and um, and even though like like it wasn't like 
a depression support group. I mean, these, it was like the, business yeah, support the, these, group. It was a business mm-hmm. support group, and and you know, and so I, you know, whether you call it a roundtable, a mastermind group, that this kind of thing. Like, I think getting in one or find if you're a CEO, um, a business leader, being in one to where you can like, you know, sit down with other business owners. Like mine, you know, my my group is five people and we're all business owners and we sit down and once a month and we talk about deep things in our business. The struggles, the good things, the bad things and seek advice from one another and it's the it's the most like it's one of the most rewarding things when it comes to business for me. I mean, to be able to seek feedback from other mm-hmm. um mastermind, you know, yeah. other people who are going through the same thing, have been through the same struggles. Um, from a business standpoint, because there's just there's going to be times where you're not able to talk to your team about specific things that are going on. Yeah. The last thing you would want to do is tell your team, "Hey, like, like we're we're about to fail." Yeah, sorry, guys. Uh, we're not sure if it, you know, like that, things like that can be super super tough. So to have that support group on a business side, I think it, it's fantastic. And I would I would really encourage you if you're a business owner, business leader, to to try to get into like a mastermind group or put your own group together. And that, that's what I've simply done. Like I've gone out and, you know, handpicked sp- specific people saying, hey, I would really like you to be in this mastermind group. And are you interested? Can you meet this one one Monday a month? You know, and we do mm-hmm. it and it's, and it's great. So I super encourage people to do that from the business side. Yeah, um, it was very helpful to be yeah. in. Mm-hmm. And I guess like for me, it's, that's really it. I mean, do you have anything else, man? I think just recognizing that other people are going through it is is it's powerful huge. in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it makes you maybe more, at least on my perspective, it make, it's made me more open. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm lucky that I have two brothers, too, that I can kind of, like, talk about anything. Or yeah. at least just hit them up at four in the morning if I needed to. <laughs> um, and that's kind of a built-in advantage. But uh, if you don't have that, I think tinkering with strategies like make yourself try to do different things and see what works because there's everyone's very different Mm -hmm. um the same as when you're leading a business you know you deal with different personalities differently and i think the more you understand your own self um you can problem solve a little bit quicker and maybe that fog clears yeah um i feel like i'm constantly in like kind of a a little fog (laughs) with everything but like most days i can like you know, poke my head through and I'm like, oh, there's a few things out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just, you guys gotta keep kind of, uh, not, I don't wanna say like grinding, but just like keep like feeling like it's okay. Yeah. You, know, it's you okay see the movie, to, What About Bob? Like baby steps, yeah. baby steps down the hallway, baby steps to the yeah. elevator. <laughs> yeah. And and I'll say I'll say one more thing, and and I'm not saying this is necessarily mm-hmm. the case with you, but I think it's the case with a a, a lot of people um, in business world is that sometimes it, it's okay not to be a business owner. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or to find somebody if you want to be if you want to own your own business. You want to be an entrepreneur, like we've talked about it before. Entrepreneurship is very much a fad. Like, yeah. Yeah. it's it's not when you've been doing it since 2000. Like, you know, you know what mm-hmm. you you've had a business since 2010. Like, you've gone through it all. But a lot of people are jumping into entrepreneurship because it's cool, and and then a lot of people simply don't don't know what they're doing. Maybe they have the creative piece, but they don't have the business piece. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and I think if you can like. I mean, consider finding a partner, somebody who has the opposite skill set, who might, you know, be the best. You know, you're you're the creative part, but then you have somebody who is like the sales part and the operations part. I mean, I'll be like, I'll be straight up, like, I, I, I feel like I'm very good at leadership. I feel like I'm really good at building team, inspiring people, yeah. heading towards a vision. Like, I feel like I'm really good at that. I'm terrible at the organizational part. Yeah, like really, mm-hmm. really bad to the point where my assistant text it like she literally texts me my schedule every morning <laughs> like 7 you know 7 30 a.m low gmv podcast <laughs> 9 30 a.m this meeting 10 30 a.m this meeting like yep. she texted to me in the morning because she knows that i'm not going to remember and i'm gonna forget a meeting i'm gonna forget like i'm just bad with the organizational part yeah you know and and that's okay mm-hmm. i think knowing your like knowing your faults knowing what you're not good at and you know focusing on the things that you are good at um can 
can mean a lot, you know, in, yeah. in your future. So that's yeah. just something that I that I encourage people to to sometimes well, think. I think of, that's a really positive way to look at it is optimizing what you're great at yeah. and not looking at your deficiencies negatively. You know, how can you best solve them? Mm -hmm. Keep getting better at what you're good at. You know? yeah. yep. And along those lines, I kind of um, was thinking about like leading up to this, I kind of came up with a list of things I've learned about being a business owner with depression and I'm working it into a blog post. But one of the things that I thought um, might be really helpful is um, in the times when you're feeling good, set up systems so that when you're not feeling good, the business still runs. Mm. Yeah. So for example, um, like I use 17 hats as kind of my client management type system. So in there is the workflow. Okay, today I need to, you know, write them a thank you note for the session. And it automatically sends out an email reminder for them. It automatically sends out the contract. It automatically sends out, hey, we're almost done with your photos. We'd love to set up an appointment. Um, having systems and having an assistant when like I can't answer emails just too hard, being like, hey, Liz, could you just, you know, take a look at this and respond for me? Um, sometimes that is all the things that you need to be able to keep your business running smoothly when you're just not in the right place. So thinking about like, okay, I'm feeling good right now. What are the plans I need to make for when I'm not feeling good to keep my business going? Um, and automating whatever you can automate, outsource whatever you know you're not gonna be good at so that that doesn't fall through the cracks. Um, I think it's super important. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, I'm super glad that you were very open about all of this, and I yeah. think it's going to provide a ton of value to a lot of people. And I, I, I so know that too. there's people out there in the same state, and and it's a, you know, it's a different kind of woe today. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was good. It, it was healthy. I think. I think. Yeah. Heck, even talking about it is it's healthy, and it's definitely been a lesson for me. So, mm. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks, man. Guys, everybody, world, thanks for listening. This is the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> uh, we'll see you later. Bye.